I'm in Bondi Junction in Sydney and I'm talking today to John Tonkin. And John, my first question is, what was modernism? Well, I'm a little contaminated by the emergence of postmodernism, just in terms of at the time when postmodernism first became a big thing in the art world was when I was actually doing very formal, what could be considered quite modern, modernist work, it was very minimal, very abstract, um, very formal work. And uh, I found it quite intimidating. And it was a particular time where postmodernism was quite militaristic and oppressive. Um, since then, I've, you know, have a much more relaxed relationship with that. Um, so I guess for me, modernism, I've done quite a lot of work that is sort of pre-modernism, it's sort of like enlightenment period, stuff that's influenced by that. Mm. Um, but I guess to me, modernism, well, post-modernism is sort of the, the unpacking of a lot of the grand narratives of modernism. So the idea of progress, the idea of well, a whole lot of things. Yeah. Um, to me, the grand narrative thing is actually the most, is, is really interesting. Because I, uh, teaching students, I actually find there's a whole lot of stuff that when we were learning about all the postmodernism stuff, it was like a bit of a paradigm shift. Whereas they're actually, young people were kind of living it. And they, you know, the YouTube, all that sort of stuff, their narratives are much more fragmented and, and they're much more skeptical. And um, it's, I think the world's changed. When you were kind of going through uh, in the, what would have been the late eighties and you know, it was very militant insofar as you, you couldn't, you really couldn't do certain things like work on anything that was formalistic. Uh, beauty, forget it. Yeah, everything had to be appropriated. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking, talking about media and things like YouTube and that kind of thing, um, then leads me on to thinking about your work and you work in video, but you don't work in video in a straightforward sense, do you? No, um, I've been working with video, for want of a better word, um, quite a bit in the last few years. But in many ways, when I first started making media, um, I'm not really very formally trained in anything. And I th as I was saying to you earlier, I studied science and then I kind of started doing other stuff. And so first of all, I was doing a lot of Super 8 and 16 mil and I was shooting a lot of, you know, experimental films mm. and it, what's been really interesting for me lately is that um, the technology the way what you can do with DSLRs and stuff in terms of shooting video feels very much like shooting film more than it feels like shooting video and I've really enjoyed going back to that but most of my practice in the intervening period has been in, um, around interactivity and you know it's very computational um, my work is I'm quite geeky most of my work involves me running my own software and so you actually come from more of a, uh, a programming background than you do from... Again, yeah, but software. again, not a formally trained programming background. I yeah. just started doing it a long time ago. So I started, you know, programming on... My, my, my history of pro learning to program pretty much parallels sort of domestic computing. So mm. using... Um, you're an English person, but BBC Model V. Oh, BBC Micro. That was the first, yeah, the first I computer I actually made art on was one of those. And I was shooting right. stuff frame by frame onto Super 8 film. Your own background is a very hybrid background. Um, and as a result, I think the work that you produce is very hybrid. You're not a video artist as such. Yeah. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, that would be a fair statement. I, I did um, make a work recently, which I think I sent you a link to, which was uh, my body with a sort of NASA soundtrack on top. Yeah. And that's quite unusual. I do every once in a while make linear video works, but it's quite unusual and in some ways I feel guilty when I make works like that I feel like I'm cheating mm. which is ridiculous but it's just that I'm so used to doing things that are some interactive and you know running as software rather than um, here have a have a video file and watch it I've been interacting with your work and it is doing something quite different from video which is normally a very linear and predictable uh, medium yeah um, I come from a background where I've done much more interactivity mm. and but I actually find overt interactivity often very boring. Mm. I mean, 
where somebody has to click here to do this and you know there was that whole thing in the kind of I guess early 90s which was the kind of interactive where you had to find the button to get to the next screen yeah um and you know I find a lot of in- I- I've always found a lot of interactivity kind of quite sham it's kind of like just a menu to a whole lot of pre-made content anyway yeah so a lot of the projects I was doing um sort of in the late 90s and early 2000s were much more about building up a database for where the audience contributed to the work and it kind of ac- accumulated stuff and often they were very simple things but the anyway I guess um I've always been a little bit jealous of video artists who put a screen in a dark room you know give the person their disc or their file and that's it it's all set up but also I'm being somewhat facetious in saying that but I'm also somewhat there's, there's something about an audience that they're much more prepared to lose themselves into a video into a passive video work yeah. whereas interactivity somehow is always reminding people that they're interacting with something so that it, it sort of stops people getting into it so I, I guess I've been really interested in exploring a somewhere between those two things so something that's more like a, a video work but is still interactive and that's I coined the phrase um, responsive video but that's how I've been describing these works because I don't want them to be overtly something that you're, you know, again, point and clicking. And that's why I've been particularly playing around with connect sensors and, and doing stuff that's um, triggered by your body and your, your movement through space rather than, you know, using a mouse or something like that. One of, one of the things that your work, uh, I think, does, particularly if you're, you come to your work, uh, if an audience comes to your work not necessarily knowing it's interactive, I think that uh, it brings your attention to your own physical being in relation to that work. Yeah, um, I mean, part of what's sort of feeding into what I'm doing is is kind of interesting in the whole field of embodied perception and embodied cognition, mm. and the whole idea that you know we aren't these disembodied heads in the world; we are actually you know situated, embedded within a body and situated within an environment, and so both the content of the works, but also the way the interface works is all sort of driving around that. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting watching people because um, often people don't realize that it's interactive until they get close to the work and pop, mm. pops a face and scares them. Or... Do you think that uh, the, the work plays the audience to some extent? Mm, as opposed to the audience playing the work? Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> Well, I, I guess you know, coming back again to these this, this sort of underlying theoretical concerns, yeah. I'm very, something that's very consistent across a few things I'm looking at at the moment is this idea of co-emergence. So not so much that one thing's driving one anyway, that, you know, that something's emerging out of the combination of the two. So in some ways, perhaps it's, you know, it's a mutual play. Mm. Is, to, to what extent is the work... Um dealing with ideas of phenomenology very much um i have been reading a little bit about phenomenology phenomenology it's a difficult lately. Word to say yeah it's a bit like massachusetts um yeah and phenomenology i find very interesting i like it very much as an idea but i really dislike reading about it like as in reading formal stuff it's just like always profoundly boring yeah yeah and i i, I only came <laughs> I, only re- I only realized that recently and i went oh i don't need to read any more of that because it's not very exciting but mm. but that said i i'm very interested in kind of you know it, from the work I just showed you, particularly the first one, um, the work uh, Experiments of Proximity, that's very much about these small moments in your life. And, you know, I was very much wanting to get that sense of just being alive and, you know, not much happening. And Mm. I'm particularly interested in how we think that we think about thinking. Yeah. And because I actually think that that is in some ways more important than how we think, because that's actually how we set ourselves up in the world. Um, but because I'm kind of trying to unpack this whole idea of cognition and things like that, the only way I felt like I could really do that was that I had to do these things at about very small moments. They can't be about big things or important things. They need to just mm. be about watching the kettle boil or, um, you know, walking down the street. Or So they're, they're really, they're kind of like the moments that make up your day yeah. that aren't part of um, a kind of a, a, an ongoing narrative of your life. These are everyday, literally everyday moments. Yeah, which is the vast bulk of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. So in your metacognition work, uh, th- there is a kind of a, an image inside an image that, you know, we move through in space and also in representation. Tell me a little bit about what you were thinking uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, thinking in that work. Okay, so a, a lot of my work I'm interested in in a more kind of direct way of thinking, a, a kind of thinking that's situated in the world. Mm. And that, that works kind of almost, I guess, the opposite, which to me is, is the more kind of Western tradition, which is us as disembodied beings in the world, um, you know, we're receiving inputs, processing stuff and acting on that kind of, you know, almost like a telematic sort of experience. And so um, in early theories around vision and stuff like that, people often posited the idea of a homunculus, which was a little person inside your head looking out. And, you know, once you start thinking about a little person inside your head, then who's inside the head of the little person, etc., etc. So that's kind of what I was trying to do in that. But what I found kind of interesting was that I also, once I started playing around with, you know, this reprocessing of putting stuff on iPads and phones and screens and stuff that, you know, we do live in such a highly mediated world these days that we are totally, you know, in a sense, everybody is um, making and, you know, shooting videos, sending them to their friends. You know, our, our experience of the world is, it has really shifted. So what, because your works are interactive, but they're interactive in a certain way, in, in very much an embodied way, rather than clicking a mouse, etc. The the audience plays a, a an active participatory role in the completion of the work. Yeah, I, I'll, just to give a bit of background, I, I used to do a lot of work where, in a sense, I built a framework and the, the user created the, or a whole body of users created the work by effectively populating the work. So I did um, quite a few projects that were around physiognomy and eugenics and stuff like that where people would take images of their face and then modify them and then stick them on the wall. And so by the end of one particular um, occasion that I showed the work, there were 10,000 images on the wall by the end of the show. So in you know, many ways, mm. I should have, should have had a closing, not an opening for that show. Mm. Um, so I've always been interested in this idea of, you know, blurring the boundary of who's making the art, I guess. Um, I guess in any interactive pro, pro, project, there is a kind of co-authoring that occurs. But yeah, I, can, I am for trying to make that quite a fluid sort of thing with this work. And, and something that's, you're not even necessarily so aware that you're doing. I mean, you, you, you might be. Mm. And I, on some levels, the work works as kind of, I guess, like a musical instrument where you're playing the work. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I, I like the idea that that's not necessarily, you know, thrust upon you. Given that your work is about technology and how we think, do you think that the new technology that we have and that is developing, I suppose, still, um, is changing how we think? I do. Um, this is quite a controversial sort of area and mm. there are arguments that people would describe as being technologically determinist, which is where you know technology has a kind of autom autonomy and a sort of driving culture for mm. Uh, often a kind of teal teleological argument, you know, again, relating to progress. But I actually find it interesting that there's, there, there is an emergence of these kind of um, more complex ways of looking at the world that aren't always placing the human at the centre. Mm. So I actually think to give technology at kind of equal footing to human um, agency is kind of interesting. And um, so to me, to me, I actually think it's kind of a co-emergence co where, you know, technologies is giving us new tools to think with um, and we're creating new technologies it's kind of this moving forward um, so you know linking back to what you were saying about before I think the way that people are now much more media savvy you know everyone has a camera pretty much in their pockets um, the, obviously the internet I think this is all shifting what's happening the access the easy access to information do you think that's changing what knowledge is very much um, you and I both teach at universities mm. and I think that universities are only just starting to deal with this and um, I think libraries are a really interesting example of institutions that have had to deal with this like mm. li the, the emergence of the internet could threaten the existence of libraries but I think actually libraries have dealt with it really well and libraries in some ways have become much more exciting places as they've become these kind of centers of knowledge and you know that and their way of dealing with that in some ways is not to become territorial but to actually sort of embrace the internet and so forth the, yeah the much more embracing of, of different forms of knowledge so yeah in a cautious way <laughs> yeah yeah but but so with uni universities i mean there are people like mit and stuff who are opening up their courses mm. and um but i don't know i mean for me what universities have to offer is much more about mindsets and stuff like that. You know, the actual conveying of information is really, 
you know, you can teach people how to access information and stuff, but you, there's not really much point about trying to give them too much information. Because of the shifts that we have in information and knowledge and what that actually is, things like what is considered to be research, I think, needs to be broadened within universities. We, we have, you know, of course, a system of peer review, which comes from particular kind of branches of, uh, you know, discipline yep. um, within universities. And, you know, where does something like, I, I, I think, where does something like this video project actually fit in, in terms of research? Yeah, sure. Um, there has been a shift to be a little bit more accepting of creative practice as research within universities. Mm. But, you know, I'm certainly still struggle with that. And I still, you know, have to really justify what I'm doing. Um, and an easy way for me to do about to do with that would be just to write more overtly theoretical stuff to go with the work. And to some extent, that's, you know, I'm having to do that. Partly because I'm doing a PhD, I have to do that anyway. Mm. Um, but, you know, I actually think that there is room for that thinking to be embedded in work as much as it can be embedded in bits of paper and bits of writing. Yeah. Um, to what extent is the execution of the work in itself, the process of realising the work, to what extent is that part of your thinking process? Well, this is very interesting in terms of also what I'm reading about at the moment because I am reading a lot of stuff around... Well, there's a guy called Andy Clark who talks about the idea of um, extended mind, who I'm not actually a big fan of because I find his his you know his 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 idea is that we extend our minds into our tools and we think through our tools, mm. and I I totally agree with that. But his version is still very much here's my mind and I'm extending it into the world, mm. whereas actually I I'm much more of a a, a more radical viewpoint, which is actually that those object you know the world and my mind you know uh, sorry. My mind is this whole system. It's not a matter of extending the mind out. The mind is actually our tools. It's you know, it's mind is a process. It's not a it's not a noun. It's yeah. a verb. Yeah. Um, so, so very much. And and I guess maybe when I say I'm working intuitively, that with with this body of work, I am very much allowing it to evolve and develop through the making of it. Mm. I quite often have had projects in the past where I come up with an idea, and it's quite disturbing to me how close the final work is to that idea. Oh, really? And it, yeah. it may take, you know, quite a long yeah. time to get there, but it's like, yeah. And a lot of the artists that I've interviewed, the, the ones that tend to use um, a lot of digital technology tend to also to be, and I don't, I'm not necessarily inferring that there's a, a causal link necessarily, but they also tend to be the artists that work um, with a particular idea and end up with a similar idea at the end of it. Right. Who, those artists who work with digital technology. Yeah, well, um, I guess because I've been programming and stuff for a long time, it, mm. particularly in the early days, it was a very arduous process to get from that first point to the end point. Yeah. And, you're f and you know, at the time I'd have friends who were musicians and the, the difference in process, so you know, they're in this process where they're it's an instantaneous response to what they're doing and then you know whereas what i was doing that loop was so slow that i think that's why it kind of led to that whereas now partly because i've been doing it for a long time and i've got more of a sense of what i'm doing but also with so with this stuff at the moment because i have built up frameworks that i can work, i can actually play with them fairly quickly now mm. um so yeah I, I i guess what i was saying before about me working more intuitively perhaps it is also just that shift of working more in, with you know thinking through the media rather than thinking and then embodying that thinking mm. into the media because a, a lot of from what I gather anyway um, with with programming uh, you don't you never really know if something's going to quite work until you hit run yeah um, but do you get a sense of how it's going to work even I'm thinking of the matrix and how they can see the numbers coming down the screen <laughs> you know do you still get a sense when you're at the programming level of uh, of how that's going to function. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and definitely, you know, I've been doing this sort of stuff for almost 30 years now, and I've yeah. definitely, I've only just got to the point recently where I actually go, ah, oh. in fact, I, and I was looking at something from almost 30 years ago recently, and I was being a bit critical, and I'm just, you know, you don't notice it at the time, but you go, oh yeah, I have learned skills and stuff, and well, sensibilities and stuff, and um, yeah, following that up, there, there is something about the mindset of programming 
that I think kind of shifts the way you work with these media. So, I mean, much as with any media, the more you learn and understand the media, the, you know, the more you can do with it. But I think that there is kind of a different sensibility that comes from being a, a programmer that you bring to it. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily better or, or than somebody who's just using software, but it's definitely a different engagement. And I, I think it allows a different sort of thinking through the medium.